lights on. I'm turned on. Are you turned yeah. on? Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turned on for Jesus. It keeps falling, so we keep trying to retape it here. But we'll see how that works for you. Praise the Lord. I was so glad to have Pastor Sandy and Lorna. Was it Lorna? Mm -hmm. At my house. It was fun. I even cooked. So we had a choice of going to a restaurant. I said, well, you know, I've got stuffed bell, 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 bell peppers. Does that sound good? So, so it was fun to have fellowship around the table together. Amen. Amen. And I have a friend with me this morning. Uh, actually, I'm with her. <laughs> she brought me. <laughs> this is uh, Barbara White. And she and her husband have ministered in, what, six continents or something like that? And they were pastors in Banning when we were out there. We turned the church over to them and went on out to India and helped get organized out there. By the way, there's a group of people still going on in India. Isn't that good to know? So uh, they're calling, they're, they're have, they have what they call a house of prayer, I believe they call it, where they're training people to be effective in prayer. So the work of God never goes down. Amen? So um, I met Barbara through uh, Women's Aglow many years ago, um, probably in the 70s. Same. So I went back there to a conference in, uh, with Women's Aglow, and that's where we met, and so we've been in touch ever since. You know, it's so wonderful to have these long-term relationships and friendships. It's really a great thing. And, of course, I met you all when? What year? Oh, I think it was earlier than that. Oh, you did? Okay, so it was just before that. Well, praise God. We're all long-termers. <laughs> Oh, praise the Lord. I'm going to mention these things that I have with me. I'm just going to say, make my day and buy them all. <laughs> but they're tools, and we are Christmas shopping right now, and you might have somebody on your list that some of this fits. This is the piano that I made several years back. How many have this one? And the wonderful thing about it, and this is a story behind the story, so to speak, the day that I made this CD was the day that they told me my daughter would die. From That was in April, and they said she would not be alive by Christmas that year. Several times I had started to make a CD where it was just ministering piano or organ, whichever one I would choose at the time. And so many things would come to try to stop me. I mean, it would just, you know, you catch on after a while. That you don't let anything stop you. Amen. So I thought, I am going to go and make this CD. The devil's had it. So I played out of my spirit for 73 minutes without any particular song. And we've had testimonies about a lot of healing, people getting healed. That they just put it on in doctor's offices. Some of the doctors have, the friend doctors, have put it in their offices and playing it as the patients come in. And different things like that. So great testimonies. And how many remember Jean Batty? My friend, we've known each other since we were 16 and 18. And I happen to be the 18. So uh, anyway, she's got this CD that she wrote. Good old hymns. Just the really good ones. And that one song that she wrote, Praise Me and I'll Rain My Glory Down, which is also on this one. She gave me permission to, for us to record it. I said, well, can we just put that on the CD? And then she decided to put it on hers. And I said, well, you better put it on your own <laughs> after we did it, after we did this one. But it's on this one and on this one. But the difference is that these are good old hymns and that particular song. And this one are all songs that came forth out of my spirit. And I remember coming here to speak for you guys Right after one of the songs was born in my spirit. It's called Come Into This Place. That's the first song on the CD. 
And this one, people are saying this is demonstration of the teaching. That's what so many people say to me. They say, oh, you didn't realize you were teaching people how to really enter in. But that seems to be the way the Lord leads me. I, I enter in and makes it easier for you, and you can learn, you learn how to just enter into the presence. Some songs I sang for a long time just because I wasn't finished. You know, in my spirit, I was going by my spirit, my inner man, and I just couldn't release them. I just couldn't let them go. So, and that's how we worship the Lord until our spirit is finished. Amen? I know you are holy. That's not one I wrote. But at the end, it's, it's quite a long song. But don't let that deter you because you'll want to just really enter in, I know. When you start telling the Lord he is holy, there just seems to be no end to it. Amen? And this is a book you guys are familiar with. Capture a City Through Praise. How do you like the new cover? Well... Grand Pastor's history is back here. <laughs> Quite a bit of history. Things that you wouldn't know. And so when I brought it up to date, I called it an update. It really hasn't changed inside too much. There's been a little, little bit of change. They were re retranslating this in Norwegian, so they kept asking me questions. Clarify this, would you clarify that? So that's the only changes that are made in this, except for there's 38 photos in here. So I, th I thought that was fun. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, my daughters are telling me, Mom, you know, there's just things about me. Even your, my children don't even know. You know, because you live a long time and you're so busy. You're so busy trying to keep up with their lives that you don't think much about yours. How many mothers and dads feel that way sometimes? So I thought, you know, there's, if, I, if I were to go home to be with the Lord, they wouldn't know what to say at my funeral. <laughs> so she loved, she loved Jesus. Her history is, <laughs> speaks for itself. But there's just exciting things that the Lord has done. And, and it's always good to capture those things by, by photo. Amen. And this is the new book since I was here last time called Pitiful or Powerful, The Choice is Yours. It, huh? it, has, it, has, a, it has space for you to write in it. So I, put, I chose this size so that you, you know, it's, it's awfully uncomfortable to write in a smaller book. So I chose this size and... Uh, it's really got a lot of packed material in here and things that you may not even realize you're dealing with that are causing you to be pitiful. And how did I write this book? Because I had the choice to be pitiful or powerful. And I decided powerful is better. Pitiful gets you nowhere. It's like, like Joyce Meyer says, you sit in a rocking chair and you go nowhere. You're just worrying and, and work, you know, working back and forth in a rocking chair, but you're not going anywhere. My life, and here's what the back of the book says, but I can tell you from my own heart. But when tragedy struck my life, I wrote this about in 1998. I wrote this book, started writing this book right after it because the Holy Spirit kept leading me to things with answers. You know, the enemy can't hit you that God doesn't give you some kind of answer. If you really stop, if you stop long enough and don't blame God. That is a trap that people get in. Did you know that the, one of the biggest signs of grief is blame? You're looking for somebody to blame. If you can't find somebody, you just go to God. Well, let me tell you, he's the best friend you ever had. You need to leave him alone. <laughs> He's not to blame. The enemy wants to destroy our lives. I was, had questions because I had prayed. I had prayed earnestly. I prayed the best I knew how. I had done everything I knew to do to try to keep this thing from happening. And it happened. So I had lots of questions to the Lord. I wasn't angry with him. I wasn't upset with him because he had walked me through it. And I was very grateful that he walked me through it. But he sent me to three months 
of classes where I went regularly where they taught you a lot of good things about spirit, soul, and body. And see, there's the difference right there. We are spirit. We're speaking spirit. That's why you have so much authority with what you say. Did you know that you're getting what you say, whether you're saying the right thing or not? People say, I don't believe in getting what you say. I said, well, you're getting exactly what you're saying. You know, <laughs> you're, you're getting it. You know, if you talk poverty, if you talk self-pity, if you talk uh, sadness and sorrow all the time, you're going to get what you're talking about. But if you will contradict it through the words of your mouth because of the power that's in you, amen? The power of God abides within us. We don't have to look for it on the outside. It's inside of us. He set the power of God inside of us. Amen? Amen? And so when we speak, we speak with power. And we don't speak pitifully. And when the tragedy uh, hit my life, I had to... I think the police that came and the, all of the, the counselor, the... The chaplain and all of them probably expected to pick me up off the ground or to have to call 911 because of the, the magnitude of what happened. And, uh, but God, I had trained myself to pray in the Spirit. And so therefore I had been praying in tongues the biggest part of that day. And the Holy Spirit had been forewarning me of some of the things that that I might be stepping through. You know, not everything you stop. Some, a lot of things we can stop. I, and I do everything I can to stop it. Amen? Because sometimes the Lord will show you things that you need to pray against and stop them before they ever happen. But when he begins to tell you, let this particular thing go now and let me have it. Well, that particular situation I was working with, I knew I had release, and I let it go with God. And so even though something happened, people have wills. You can't violate a person's will. God won't even violate your will. He won't make you go to Africa. All of us so many times in our lives as young people thought if we yielded our lives to the Lord, the Lord was surely going to send us in the dark continents of Africa. Well, listen, I wished he had sent me. He, went me, uh, he sent me this last year, and I loved it. But we had this missionary mind that everybody was so poor, had no food, and there are situations like that. I was in a place where I saw grandmothers look like they were my age. It was hard to tell that people had what age they were because many of them had had such a hard life that they looked older than they were. But I saw them with the babies on their backs. And I said to the missionaries that I worked with, my goodness, that's the grandma carrying that baby. She's, he, they said, yes, because of AIDS, almost a whole generation was wiped out, both mother and father. So the grandmothers inherited. And of course, there's many orphanages. But those, those are some of the things. But I saw the power of God working. I saw hungry people. I saw wonderful things there. And I told you all about that because I saw it on the Internet that I told you. It was on YouTube. <laughs> so the whole trip was on display up here. And so... I've been to Norway since then, I think, since I talked to, to you about that. And the Lord sent me to Norway in, in 1984. And it was in Norway. The Holy Spirit said to me, great revival is going to come to this nation. If you want to be part of it, you have to come back quickly. And so we went back and worked there and even lived there for a couple of years. It felt like I had returned home. It really did. I, I recognized everything in the airport. I recognized the roads. You know, it, it can seem so different in another country. And the pastors and the people that I had met have now multiplied. The people that we put into during those years have now have several churches. And you have more churches than this one here, too, don't you? That, huh? 
there's been the work of God never stops. You know, we're much bigger than the number of people. If we get our eyes on the number of people, we liable to miss something great. Amen? But if we keep our eyes on the kingdom and all that God has for us, we'll be amazed how much stronger we will be. Hallelujah. And so anyway, this is the book that I wrote. And you'll, it says, you'll gain insight into overcome grief, divorce, sickness, financial loss, anything that happened of the past. And then you'll get, excuse me, a new mental perspective. Now, that's what I feel the Holy Spirit is leading me to speak about this morning, is getting a new mental perspective. He just keeps uh, speaking about it this morning through you, Pastor Sandy, and through you, Pastor Don. When you said different things, and I went, well, yeah, glory to God. That's what I felt. So, Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the honor of, of giving your word to your people. We thank you for your peace. Thank you for the anointing. Thank you for the power of God working. We give you great glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. And I think I'll do number eight. Isn't that called free, free indeed? And can somebody mind getting the words for me? You know, I only write these songs. I don't know them. <laughs> when the Holy Spirit gives you something so many times, you don't remember it because it's not you. It comes forth out of your spirit. It's in that little booklet in the cover of the CD. It's up in front. Some people don't realize that that CD has multiple parts. The first CD is Gina and I singing and uh, other voices and uh, songs that the Lord gave us. And uh, then the next one is orchestration or ill instruments. So you could just sit down with the instruments and not hear words and just get your little words out of the front and sit down and have your own little praise session. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, that's, thank you. Free indeed. How many are free indeed? We sang this last Sunday up in Victorville in a Pentecostal church. And boy, did they ever get happy. The whole congregation stood up and the praise team sang with us and all kinds of instruments joined in with us. It was a fun thing. So if you want to stand up and sing it, fine. If you don't, that's fine. I need to hear it really good. I am free, free, free. Yes, I'm free indeed. I am free, free, free. Yes, I'm free indeed. He brought me out of bondage into his marvelous light. I am free, free, free. Yes, I'm free indeed. On the day of Pentecost in the upper room, they were filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke with other tongues. Folks were confounded because of how they sounded in the language of the Spirit. They understood. They were free, free, free. They were free indeed. They were free, free, free. They were free indeed. He brought an anointing which brought abounding light. They were free, free, free. They were free indeed. Jesus, 
power in the blood, power in the blood. There's power in the blood of Jesus. There's power in the blood. There's glory in the blood of Jesus. Glory in the blood. Glory in the blood. There's glory in the blood of Jesus. There's glory in the blood. We are free, free, free. Yes, we're free indeed. We are free, free, free. Yes, we're free indeed. He brought us out of bondage into his marvelous light. We are free, free, free. Yes, we're free indeed. We are free, free, free. Yes, we're free indeed. Hallelujah. My daughter said, Mother, you sort of got in touch with your Pentecostal roots when you made that one. <laughs> Number one, I'm going to... I remember just writing, just having written this song, and I came here to speak right after you guys started. It's called Come Into This Place. I can tell you that there is a place that we can come into with the Lord, that even no matter what happens in life, there is a place where he shields us and he keeps us. Amen? Are you do another song? Yeah, number one. I have a built-in one. I don't know if we need it. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's another invention. Somebody here get a witty idea. Yes. <laughs> they may not have it yet. <laughs> when I was in North Carolina, I, have a, I had a convertible at the time. And uh, the window, you know how the window, you electric window goes up? Well, mine wouldn't do either way. So you had to hold it up. So I was talking to some of the men in the church on how to get it fixed. And you would be surprised the inventions I got from all of the guys. <laughs> some of them said, well, just tuck, duct tape it and keep driving. That's the cheapest way. <laughs> I said, no thanks, I, I, I'm not tacky, thank you anyway. <laughs> but duct tape does amazing things, amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Come into this place where the world cannot contest what I've done in you. He's, he's done great things in us, amen? <laughs> Lord, Lord to me, I 
heart overflows with love to you. Jesus, you are adored. I praise you, Lord, today for all you are, all you are to me. Your precious in my sight. Jesus, I love you. <laughs> when I was recording this song, the Spirit of the Lord touched me so deeply that I began to weep because I could see people's faces who would realize they could come into that place for the first time and feel that, that love of the Lord. So it's been wonderful to be able to have these songs and God's sending them around the world. He's already doing it. So any good? One guy requested from India that he could just take snips of um, some of the songs and, and put them on uh, so the Indian people could hear them. And then they can get them on iTunes and Spotify. So, And, of course, they did similar in Norway. So when I was in here in California in the early uh, 70s, I was in a choir that was called the Audre Meyer Choir, Recording Choir. How many remember that choir? A couple of you. <laughs> so I was in that choir. I was what they called the baby of the choir. There was nobody in my age in that choir at that time. And I was in my 20s. <laughs> so it was a really wonderful experience. But Audre Meyer, remember one night something had happened and we had gone to, I had gone to another city to sing. We sang in different churches and sometimes on TV and different things. And so I had gone to uh, that particular meeting that night and my little daughter, Bargina, was with me. And uh, something had happened to trouble my soul. And, uh, but when I went to and sang with the choir, after the meeting was over, uh, I went up to say something to Audra Meyer, and she began to prophesy to me. And she didn't really know that much about me, even though I was in the choir. You know, she comes in, and she teaches us and trains us every week and gets us to sing. And yet, first she would take devotionals and spend time with us in the Lord, which was awesome. She was so anointed. So I loved it. And so she began to speak to me, and she said, Rachel, there are music. there's music in you that God has written already, but there will be others, and they will go around the world. So today, with the media being the way it is, you know, at that time, you wonder how in the world could that ever happen? Um, who's, who's Rachel Jeffries? <laughs> you know, but God has ways. Amen? He has ways of doing it. So I'm going to take us to Judges in, in the sixth chapter. We see the story of Gideon here. And I think many of us can identify with this. I know Barbara and I were talking yesterday. Both of us are widows now. She has a widow's ministry called Winning Widows. And the Lord started us out together and widows with purpose. And the Lord dealt with me because I, we were doing a good job. Almost too good. People couldn't keep up with us. We're both so full of energy. Isn't that great? So it was difficult for, uh, really, for people to keep up because we both had so much in us. And the Holy Spirit dealt with me and dealt with me and dealt with me, and it was so hard 
Sometimes it's hard to do what the Lord's telling you to do, isn't it? In the flesh. So I said to her, Barbara, I just know the Lord. We still thought we might be doing some things together. And who knows, we may still. But you got to obey the Lord. So I said, I just feel like the Lord wants you to take your, your place. And she already had a name. And she thought it was just for a conference we might put together or something. So anyway, I think it's helped you, Barbara, to see what God can do for Barbara. We were talking last night, 31 things that she's writing down that were major things that the Lord has done for her since she's been a widow. And I, my, I've been a widow a lot longer, so mine will probably be a hundred or two. But just a short time that the Lord has done marvelous things that blessed us both. And so if you are a widow here this morning, God has a new life for you. I remember my mother becoming a widow at 52. And uh, she, she, you know, to me, I was really crying out, I need to go help my mother, I need to go do this. And somebody with some wisdom said, Rachel, you need to stay out of the way and let your mother find her way. And my mother found her way. She really did. She bought old houses and began to remodel them and resell them. And she never owed any money on any houses that she bought from that point on because she knew what to do. She was very creative. And so God has a new life for us. It may, it may not be the same, and there will be parts of your life that you will miss. But at the same time, you can't bemoan what you don't have anymore. You've got to look at the better thing and what God has for you. I've done more in my life, and I've done an awful lot already. But it just seemed like some of the things that were really deep in my heart have come to pass uh, now. So I really do praise God. I have five books that are ready to go. There's another one. Barbara asked me last night, what's happening with that book? We're writing about widows. I said, well, I'm working on it. <laughs> but I've got five that have been edited and worked on for quite a while. And one of the men... Um, the publisher that I've met in Tulsa, Oklahoma, is really good. He usually it costs you how much, Barbara, per book? To make it look proper. This guy did this one, pitiful or powerful, the one I've got here. He did it for me, and I think he did a good job, don't you? And he has offered to do all five of my books. For around, I forget the exact number, but like $2,500. You don't have that happen. You just don't. So anyway, it's, uh, it's a miracle. And he says, if God tells somebody to help you get them out, then I will give them a discount. <laughs> but I call in your air conditioning and heating here first. <laughs> Amen. I'm just telling you so you can agree with me. Amen. And it's happening. I believe it is happening. So let's look in uh, Judges 6. I said 16, didn't I? Sorry. Did I say 6? I turned to 16 up here. That's another, ser that's another sermon in chapter 16. And we'll probably get to it in this. But we know that Gideon was a man who could not see himself. Am I still in the wrong chapter? Okay, this is talking about Joshua. I'm wanting to talk about Gideon. Huh? The beginning of verse 6. No wonder I'm in the wrong book. That's why it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Glory to God. There's two J's, Joshua and Judges, and I was in the wrong J. I thought, this is about Joshua. That was Capture City <laughs> book. But we see here that Gideon, there's, there was so much going on 
It was a dark time. If we look at verses, we'll start with the first verse. The Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of the Midian, of Midian for seven years. Have you ever felt like the Lord withdrew his hand? He may not have because of the New Testament tells us he never leaves us nor forsakes us. But there's just sometimes something doesn't seem right and you're not so aware. I can't imagine how bad this must have felt because they knew God had withdrawn his hand and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Their enemies prevailed against them. And because the Midianites, the children of Israel, made them den, made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so as it was, when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of, of the east even came up against them and then camped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou, thou come into Gaza and left no substance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. They destroyed everything that Israel had. And they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers. Have you ever seen a group of grasshoppers? I mean, so thick you can't, you can't see the grass. You can't see anything else. They're so thick. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. They were overcome by the enemy. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. How many know how to cry unto the Lord? I know how to cry unto the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's the shortest prayer. <laughs> Jesus wept is the, next, the shortest verse. But help. <laughs> shortest prayer. <laughs> so they cried out to the Lord. I've lost my place. Okay, and it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you, he brings back to their memory, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you. And, and drove you from where before, from before you and gave you their land. So he's reminding them. It's always so good to remember the wonderful things the Lord has done, especially when you're in a difficult time. Instead of feeling sorry for yourself, go back and think of the wonderful things the Lord has done for you. Say, well, uh, I can't see much of what God has done. Well, get your eyes open. Because he's always doing something. He's always doing something. He's, he's wonderful. We just need to open our eyes to it. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. For you have not obeyed my voice. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, and pertained unto Joash, the Abenjurite, and his son Gideon, Thrashed wheat by the wine press to hide from the Midianites. Now this man had every reason to feel sorry for himself. He's hiding from the enemy and rightfully so because they've come in like a bunch of grasshoppers as we've read here. They came in with all their goods and, and destroyed everything that Israel had. So the angel of the Lord appeared unto him but things are about to change. Hallelujah. The angel of the Lord appeared to him, and here's what the Lord said immediately. The Lord is with thee, thy mighty man of valor. And Gideon said, sometimes we need to be quiet. But Gideon said, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all the... All the uh, all of this befallen us. And then he, he, with where he and his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midians. 
Medians. It was their disobedience that caused them to walk right into the hands of the enemy. Did you know that our own disobedience caught, puts us in jeopardy? It's not God putting us in jeopardy. It's our own disobedience. We find it with, jo with uh, Jonah. The Lord told him to go one place. He decided to go. You notice God didn't fight his will. He let him go, but he prepared a big fish to rescue him. So if we do something wrong, he's got a big fish there to rescue us. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the Lord looked upon him and said, go into this, go in this thy might that thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall smite the Midianites as one man. I mean, the circumstances were really bad, weren't they? I mean, everything's being devoured. The crops are being devoured. The cattle's being destroyed. The land's being destroyed. Everything is going wrong. And Gideon has no reputation of success whatsoever. Not only him, but nobody in his family has ever been a success in anything that was mentionable. But God said, I want you. You know, they have those signs, Uncle Sam wants you. God says, I want you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Then he said unto him, If now I found grace in thy sight, then give me a sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come to thee, and bring forth my present and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until you come again. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid and unleavened cakes of an ephra of, of flour, the flesh he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot, and he brought it out of the oak tree and presented it. And the angel said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth, and he did so. And the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes and then rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And when Gideon perceived, did you know that you can meet an angel and not really perceive that's what it was? Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I've seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto you. Fear not, for thou shalt not die. Fear, dealing with fear, is a big thing. I think of some of the fears that I have dealt with in my life. I, I, my mother, I love her, and she's in heaven. But she was one of the most fearful people I've ever met. I mean, I've met more, but she was so afraid of so many things. It was nothing. I was acquainted with loaded guns because mom knew how to shoot them. And she was a brave person. One day that we, she came home from work and all of us kids are standing beneath a tree and we're looking up. Maybe I've told you this story. And we're all standing there looking up in the tree. And mom says, what are you guys looking at? And we said, mom, there is a snake that keeps coming out of that tree and it does something with its tongue. You know, <laughs> and we were laughing. Our kids were innocent. And mom says, you guys move out of the way. She goes in, gets the barrel, the loaded gun. <laughs> and no more. <laughs> Everybody in town heard that mom was a good shooter. And every time I'd go get any errands for her and go to the grocery store or whatever, they'd say, mom, has your mom been shooting anything else lately? <laughs> but she blew that thing to pieces. And all the babies kept coming out of the tree for several days. And so she, knowing mother, she took care of that too. But um, just before she died, she was probably 80, I would say 89. 
And there was a snake showed up on the property where she lived. And this is a condo area where snakes don't normally decide to come. But that one decided to come. And all of these, now this is funny. All of these people are out there looking at this big old snake coiled and, you know, how they act. And moms, and, and even the men are saying, <laughs> they don't know what to do about it. Mom says, just wait, I'll be right back. <laughs> she goes to her shed and she comes out with a hoe and kills that booger. <laughs> And she even gets it and puts it in a bag and takes it to the trash. I mean, that's my mother. And I think she was hitting 90, and one of the ladies' TV broke down. And, and she said, well, let me take care of that for you. <laughs> so she goes over to the lady's house. This lady tells me this. And she said, she picked up my great big TV and took it back from me to Walmart and gave me a refund. <laughs> So I come from good stock. <laughs> Hallelujah. So here was Gideon. I mean, we were brought up poor. I guess that's where I started thinking about my life. But I, we didn't know we were poor because my folks always bought cows. They bought hogs and they bought everything. You know, and we had a freezer packed full when they had freezers. We remember an ice box. I remember the box, ice coming in the ice box so I remember those days but once we got a freezer you know we would keep those things but I know a little bit how Gideon must have felt I really had blessings when I look back in my life and I suppose today they would probably call me a pro pro child prodigy because of the things that God did for my life in spite of poverty in spite, mother was a tither though, so poverty didn't stick to us. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know we were poor. I was blessed. You're never, you're never poor when you're blessed. Amen? She taught us kids to tithe. If we made one dollar, ten cents went to the house of God. You know, we'd go up to the altar and take our offering. And, and I, just, I, I got a job when I was 12. They hired me and then realized I was 12. And you weren't supposed to, char to, to, uh, to uh, hire someone until they were 16. But the manager said, well, just keep your mouth shut. I'll cover it. So I don't know how he covered it. But anyhow, I made $3.50 a weekend. 35 cents and more went to the house of God. So I knew about tithing and giving. And you can't outdo the Lord. So today I still know that I often confess that when I walk into these really fancy department stores, they decide to have a sale. But it's a redeeming thing. I don't have a poverty mind. If it's $200 and I want it and I got the money, that's fine. But knowing how I think... I want that $200 item for about 50 <laughs> The redemptive power of the Lord. <laughs> so God is good to us when we tithe and when we give. He just, you can't outdo that Lord. He's, he's so good. There's no way for me to have a new house in the natural. And yet you visited me at my new home. Did you like the area? It was beautiful, wasn't it? lived in a beautiful area, there is no way I could be there in the natural. But, but God is a redeeming and restoring Lord. He is so good. And so we see here the angel, angelic beings ministering to Gideon in the most awesome, I mean, not awesome, awful circumstances. An angel comes and comes to him. I've had, I've had angelic visitors and not always realizing they were angels till later. I just, uh, I'm trying to think of a couple of them, but one particular one, I was in Sweden, and I was standing at the place, a uh, Dunmus, they call it, Dunmus, D-O-M-U-S, store. It's like our, sort of like our Walmart here, and it has everything in it. And uh, so I was standing there getting ready to pay for the items that I had picked up, and this man walks up to me. I can see him now. He was in a red 
like a golf shirt. What do you call those shirts? Huh? Pullovers. Polo, excuse me. Yeah, it's instead of polo, it was a sweater. So polo shirt, it was red. And he walked up to me, and he seemed very nervous. And he started being anxious and said to me, just out of the blue. Now, I don't know how he knew to speak English to me. There was nobody around me speaking English. He walked up to me and spoke English. And he said to me, you must obey God and not man. Well, I look at him probably like he had two heads. You know, like, how did you know to speak English to me? You know, natural things, thoughts. How did you know to speak English to me? And how, where did you come from? How did, do you know that there's an advertisement in the paper here? And you saw my picture? I didn't know how he knew who I was. And so he looked at me very earnestly like, you've got to get this message. He said, I ha this is how he said it, I have a message from God, and I know I do. And he looked me straight in the eye, and he said, you are to obey God and not man. Well, that's the scripture. So I looked at him again, and then all of a sudden, he repeated it. And then my husband comes, that was when he was alive, and he came over with an interpreter. And he looks at the interpreter and him and speaks English and says, I have a message from God. I know I do. It's, he was frustrated like nobody's paying him any attention. So he said, I have a message from God. I know I do. You are to obey God and not man. I looked at him and smiled and let him know, basically, I got it. That's all. And so we want this man's different. Who is he? So the interpreter, we go out the door. He goes out the door ahead of us, and we, he's nowhere to be seen. We're two steps behind him. There was no way for him to be gone, but he was gone. We were going to talk to him further. The interpreter said, well, I'll find out, you know, what, what he meant and how he got this. He saw your picture in the paper. So when we landed at the pastor's home, we said, did you advertise and put us in the paper this time? And he said, no. He said, the first time we haven't done it. He said, we couldn't get it done for some whatever reason it was. So I knew that an angel had visited us in that store. And he had, he said, I have a message from God and I know I do. Now, how would he know to say that to me? You understand what I'm saying? And so often that's the way it is. I could give you that since that's not totally the message this morning, I could tell you one more and more and more and more experiences that I've seen the angels of the Lord work in, in odd situations and seem like there was no way out in some of them. But he, he just came on the scene and spoke. So Gideon had an angelic. But the thing I want to deal with this morning is that Gideon through this visitation, began to get a mental picture. He not only got his mental picture changed, but that of his whole family. Now, it didn't happen easily. His dad could have killed him because he tore down all the idols that his father had. He could have lost his life. There's never anything worth in life that you don't have to fight for it that there isn't, doesn't have value to it. There are things in life I've had to fight for that have great value now to me because I knew what I had to do to get to the other side. And so God changed this mental perspective. When we were growing up, like I said, I was, you know, we were what some people look at, maybe thinking that we were poor. Uh, but here we are at one of my nephew's wedding. This is next generation. And we're sitting here in this chapel where he's getting ready to be married. And guess who's sitting beside me? The lieutenant governor of South Carolina. I said to my mom, would you have ever believed <laughs> that we would have been sitting in the house of God with one of your grandchildren getting married? And here's the lieutenant governor of the state sitting next to us. I tell you. 
The Lord changes. You say, well, that's not a big deal. Well, it was a big deal to us. Because we knew in the natural where we came from. But I was one of the most best-dressed kids you've ever seen because my mother knew how to manage. She had the wisdom of God in her. People will say today when they call me up from South Carolina and they say, remember, Rachel, do you remember thus and so? I remember you guys were the best-dressed kids around. The, being a tither and a giver, I don't know why I'm hitting this so hard this morning, but the Lord knows. You, you can't afford not to do it. Amen. You say, well, you don't know how bad things are at my house. Well, it's not going to get any better until you decide to put God first. Amen. That's what he says. His word says it. It will not get any better. The devourer, you get a guarantee, like Sister Sandy said this morning. You get a guarantee that the devourer is rebuked over your house. There are things that start to break down at my house. And maybe they're not that old. And I say, no way the devourer is rebuked. You stand on your promises. You speak them out of your mouth. And we say, that sounds like a lot of work. Well, don't be lazy because it works. Amen. I've had more redeeming things happen lately. You want to hear these testimonies? I call this my precious Bible. See it? If you could see it up close, you'd see it. Somebody said, that's precious. It doesn't even have, it comes apart very easily. <laughs> there's a piece. But there's so much in here and so much that has been marked and all of this. You understand, don't you? How many have precious Bibles? One night, I went to church recently, and we, I went with some friends, and I got to get judges again. And I went... Um, to church, and we came home from church, and we were parked in the parking lot of a strip mall. Some friends picked me up there, and then we went on to church together, so I would be easier for me, because the church is on a hill, and trying to walk up and down the steps, and all that kind of stuff, so they were being nice. So we come home from, from church. I get out of the car, and I can't find my car keys. So I'm taking my purse completely apart, still can't find them. So like a dummy, I took my Bible in my Bible case and set it on top of my car. How many know the story? Uh-oh. Not thinking any more about it. I finally found the keys in the back seat of their car, but I forgot to bring the Bible down. I didn't want to set it on the ground to me. It was my precious Bible. I didn't want it on the ground. So I put it up in a higher place. <laughs> I drive off. The next day I called everybody in that mall to see where that Bible was because it dawned on me because I have several Bibles. So I was reading out of others and I thought, oh, I missed my Bible. I got to go get it out of the car. Well, it wasn't anywhere to be seen. So I kept saying, the devourer is rebuked. I have my Bible. I don't know where it is, but I have it. I have my Bible. And so that was the weekend at the church. They thought maybe I sat it down in the church, so they had the team there check. And so nowhere to be found. I kept saying I have my Bible. And it rained, poured down raining that night. Poured. Not, you know, if you've ever been in Branson... It's not drizzle. It never hardly. It comes down with like a gusher most of the time. Once in a while we'll get a nice little soft rain, but not often. So your head would say, your Bible's gone. It's flooded. Who knows where it is? Your head would say that. So I go and I pray, and a friend came over and prayed with me. And I was working on this book, actually. And I'm just thanking the Lord my Bible's been found. And all my friends are supportive of me. And they're saying, Rachel, we know that Bible's found. Do you have your name in it? I said, no, I doubt it. Because there's nothing in the front of it. You know, all the ID, all that stuff has gone a long time. So one day, I, I don't always hear my phone ring in the house. I was gone, I guess. And I forgot to check the voicemail. 
And we're in the bedroom praying. We're just not in the bedroom, but in my office. And we're really praying over this book and working. And I noticed that I had a message on the house phone and ministry phone. So I picked it up and checked it. And here was this voice that said, Rachel Jeffries, you don't know me. This is Casey Walker. I have your Bible. I tell you, I started praising the Lord. I had already been praising him. It was found. But this young man had found this Bible in the middle of the road, about a half a block from where I went. In the cover, praise God, he didn't know the Lord. So I got a chance to talk to him when I went to pick the Bible up and rewarded him and blessed him. He said, you know, don't, don't thank me. He said, I'm the scavenger. I see stuff in the road all the time and I pick it up. He said, I found a person's laptop, all their birth certificates, their passports and everything in the middle of the road in a bag. They must have been moving and everything fell off the back of wherever they were. And he said, I returned it all. So I thanked him and thanked him. But even these little things in life, the reason I'm talking to you about it, we forget who we are. So I, I wept and thanked him and was so grateful. Of course, I'm just very grateful for this Bible. I don't know. I need a new one. Somebody keeps you saying you need a new one, but I don't want a new one. <laughs> this is precious. But he got this Bible out of the middle of the road in a left-hand turn lane where it's very extremely busy, and he found it 15 minutes before the downpour came. Little things in life that we, that we forget. So there's, there are angels of the Lord. They're people sometimes, <laughs> real people. And sometimes they're angelic beings. But Gideon obeyed the Lord. He did what the Lord told him to do. And he began to see so many victories that it totally changed his mental outlook on life. If we look in Judges 8, 18 through 22... He began to see himself as a king. Now this is the man who said, I'm the poorest of all the poor. Nothing has ever happened good in my family. And here, here's the man who began to get, he began to win the victories over the adversary. Don't lay down when the enemy attacks you. Go for the victory. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go for the victory. Glory to God. He asked the kings, he said, because they had slaw, sl slew some people. And he said, these men we slew look like the children of a king. These were Gideon's family. And Gideon answered, those were my brethren, the sons of my mother. If you had saved them alive, I would not slave you. Now this is the man who saw himself as a weak, weakling. All of a sudden, he said, if you would have spared my brothers, the, the sons of my mother, I would have spared your life. But since you didn't, I'm taking you out. So that sounds awfully bragging. Well, he did it. He said, I will have to slay you. So Gideon, Gideon began to know who he was. They offered him the kingship over Israel. And he refused the position. And he said, the Lord shall rule over you not me are my sons so he went from being a pitiful victim to being a victor and from being powerful pitiful everybody has the opportunity to feel sorry for themselves there was recently something happened that I felt I was not wanted you ever got that feeling Go someplace and you feel like, like you're a duck out of water and you don't belong there. So this feeling was looming at me. I didn't know where it was coming from. I couldn't figure out anybody who didn't really like me. You know, I thought, hmm. And you, you sometimes do that. You, you sort of go, well, wonder what this is about. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, take authority over the spirit. And so I did obey the Lord with that. 
And it was almost like immediately I didn't feel that anymore when I got in this presence of this people. So remember, your enemies are not flesh and blood. But there are, there are the enemy, Satan himself and his cohorts. So as we change our mental perspective, let's look, let's look at another person who changed their mental perspective. Ruth was a woman whose husband had died. She went with Naomi into a foreign country. <laughs> Brit, uh, Brit. Barbara has written about this, and I've, I'm writing about it too, so we're going to compare notes to see who did what. But anyway... <laughs> So he, she went there knowing no one but her mother-in-law. She had no right in this new land. She was at the mercy of God. She had seen Naomi's God work for her. And she went so far as to say, wherever you go, I will go. She was willing to leave behind. And God gave her a husband. And this husband we know is Boaz. He brought her out of poverty and he redeemed her from being Naomi's nearest kinsman. He is mentioned, she is mentioned, in the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. She got a new mental perspective of who she was. And it happened in the manifestation of her life. Now, one that we all have heard about is Job. Job was sick. He lost his whole family. He lost his cattle. He lost everything that he had. But with the end of the story is that he prayed for his friends who did not speak the right words into his life. And God gave him twice as much as he had before. I love this scripture. Job 20, 40, excuse me, 42 verse 10. So many times I used to hear it when I was growing up from some of my relatives. It's religious to say, well, I'm just another Job. It's religious thinking. Job didn't have the new covenant like you and I have. And besides, it wasn't God doing it. It was Job's fear. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. All these horrible things that tried to come to him, it was a, the fear was the basis of his challenge. And I'm going to read to you what he said. And I'm going to read it out of the, um, I believe it's the Message Bible here. Job was a man who lived in us. He was honest inside and out. Sounds like a man who doesn't do anything wrong, right? A man of his word who was totally devoted to God and hated evil with a passion. He had seven sons and three daughters. He was also very wealthy, 7,000 head of sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen, 500 donkeys, and a huge staff of servants. And he was the most influential man in all the East. If there was anybody that we would think qualify for greatness, this man looks like he should. His sons used to take turns hosting parties in their homes, always inviting their three sisters to join them in their merrymaking. When the parties were over, Job would get up early in the morning and sacrifice a burnt offering for each of his children, thinking, maybe one of them have sinned. One of them sinned by defying God inwardly. He knew what he could see outwardly, but he wanted to know if they even had sinned inwardly. And Job made a habit of this sacrificial atonement just in case they sinned. You know what this is? Worry. This is a perfect picture of worry. Yeah. Am I supposed to quit in a minute? Okay. I thought I saw a watch there. Okay, I just want to say to you, your mental perspective today can be changed. Amen. God has called us to a new mental perspective. I never think of myself as being a poor little widow without anything. I don't allow it. If people start to feel sorry for me, I dodge their presence. I just won't allow it because I am not. I don't look at my social security check. I look at the heavenly. 
It's in the bank. Hallelujah. And let me tell you, it works. You got it in the bank of heaven. Glory to God. Does everybody here this morning know the Lord Jesus Christ? You believe they do? Okay. Well, you can't get the fish if they're not in the lake. So, the river of life, yes. Hallelujah. Praise God. I just want to say I appreciate being with you again. And I hope I kept you awake. <laughs> the anointing. And we will have these books back there. If you know anybody who's going through a hard time, it's really compassionate. Maybe I don't found compassionate. But compassion helps you get out of it. Sympathy really sympathizes with the person gets down there with them. And I understand empathy and I understand sympathy. But compassion pulls you out. They take you by the hand and help you get up out. And I believe this book is full of compassion. Amen.